Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to recommend books by one of my favourite 20th century classic authors, E. M. Forster. Although he only died in 1970, all of his novels were actually written during the first quarter of the 20th century. He wrote six novels between 1905 and 1924 and today I'm going to talk about them and tell you which one I would recommend if you're only just starting out with his literature. I'll briefly discuss all six of his novels in this video, of course, without spoilers. And if you're interested in similar where to start with videos, I've done one about Jane Austen's work, one about Oscar Wilde's and one about Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, all of which you'll find linked in the description box if you're interested. Before we get into the novels of Ian Forster though, I should mention that he also wrote many short stories, essays, non-fiction like uh, travel logs, and he even adapted a Herman Melville novella into the libretto for Benjamin Britten's opera Billy Budd, uh, which is a great 20th century opera and I can recommend it if you enjoy modern opera. But today, like I said, I want to talk about the novels. I love all six of them and on Goodreads I've given them all either four or five stars. All of his novels share certain characteristics and themes and they are, the novels are in a way very alike, but there are two novels that really stand out to me. And the first one is also the one I would recommend if you've never read an E.M. Forster novel before and it is this one, Howard's End. Uh, this was published in 1910 and it is really representative of Forster's writing in my opinion. The main characters are two sisters, Margaret and Helen, and they are presented as very modern women, very well-educated, liberal, confident, but most importantly rich. Their lives are contrasted to two other families in the novel. There's the Wilcoxes, who are also rich but definitely considered more middle class since they made their money in trade. Uh, they have a more traditional outlook on society and they often clash with the more progressive sisters, Helen and Margaret. And then there's the Basts, who represent the working classes. Their prospects aren't great and they have less opportunity than the other two families to amass wealth and social status despite their hard work. As you can tell just from this bare summary, Forster likes to talk about class. Why wouldn't he? He was a British author after all, and you all know the Brits like to talk about class. Class and social expectations shape pretty much every human interaction in this book. There are all sorts of different relationships, familial, romantic, sexual, and that's where Ian Forster really shines, when he explores the subtleties of human interaction and human relationships within this rigid societal context of turn-of-the-century Britain. He always writes with a subtle and sometimes less subtle uh, humour that usually comes from the clashing of people with different personalities or different backgrounds or different cultures. The reason why I recommend Howard's End as the first Forster novel, the, the gateway drug, so to speak, is because those themes, which we see in all of his work, are really taken to perfection in this one. The beauty of his work lies in the characters and how they feel and behave and move through the world. The plot, like with all of his other novels, is a result of the characters' motivations. And Howard's End manages to be very rich and slow moving, the sort of plot that almost stands still until everything is shaken up and the balance of the world is disturbed. So this is not a book for people who like straightforward, linear or fast moving storylines. The tone is so light and sometimes fluffy but there's always an underlying melancholy which I really love. Really I recommend you start with How It's End because it's so quintessentially Ian Forster if you don't like this one, you likely won't enjoy his other novels either. But let's move on to the second of the Forster novels, which really stands out to me, and that is Morris. This one was written just before the First World War, but it wasn't released until 1971, after Forster's death. The tone of Morris is much heavier than in Howard's End, and the lightness of his other novels is missing a bit in this one. The melancholy is just much heavier, much closer to the surface. It is also notably his only queer romance story. The main character, 
unsurprisingly named Morris, is a young man of the upper middle classes with a fairly unexceptional personality and no great talents and someone who at the beginning seems very comfortable with his place in society. At university he falls in love with another student named Clive and the two start a relationship. Clive is richer than Morris, more upper class, more intelligent, more romantic, just more exceptional as a person. But when they both graduate university, he breaks up with Morris and begins to deny that there ever was a romantic relationship between them. The rest of the novel follows Morris as he tries to deal with this rejection and suddenly finds himself at odds with the heteronormative society of early 20th century England. Morris deals with a lot of the same topics as Howard's End and as the other four Ian Forster novels, notably Class. Relationships are central to the story and the way these relationships are shaped by class and society also shapes the plot of the novel. Morris feels like a more straightforward rendering of this theme because while the conflict between human desires and society is a bit more subtle in his other novels where the clash is usually between different cultures or different classes it is really obvious why Morris is preventing from living his life as authentically as he wishes homosexuality just didn't become legal in the UK until 1967. The novel also discusses another societal force which is often the driving force of Ian Forster's plots and that's the idea of conventionality. Morris is a very conventional main character with very conventional motives and very conventional desires but his sexuality which is deemed unconventional by his society drives him to become an outcast in a sense to live parts of his life in secrecy and that then drives other unconventional life choices that he makes. Many of Forster's characters can be understood through their desire either to be conventional or unconventional. Especially his female characters often strive for unconventionality but then find that society holds them back. Morris is kind of the opposite. A completely average man whose completely average motivations like the desire to be loved and in a stable relationship are seen as subversive by the people around him. Out of the six Forster novels, Morris is possibly the most overtly political since it's dealing with relationships considered illegal by the state. At the same time, it feels like the most real and raw and honest of his novels and that's why I love it so much and can really recommend Morris if you are after, first of all, a queer classic of which there aren't many, but second of all, if you are up for something a bit heavier, a bit more melancholic. Forster's other novels, of course, also tend to deal with politically sensitive issues at the time. Often the conflicts in his stories are set around a clash of cultures. A Passage to India is the last novel published during his lifetime in 1924 and it deals with the life of a young Indian doctor during British occupation of India and his dealings with British men and women. Since I don't know very much about colonial life in India, I find it very hard to judge whether this portrayal is accurate or whether the conflicts and relationships between the characters are realistic. It is an interesting novel though and it stands out among Forster's works as the only one that's set outside of Europe. It is full of the same subversions and subtleties of his other works and I can recommend it as a second or third novel of his. Now Forster's debut novel, Where Angels Fear to Tread, from 1905, takes a similar culture clash thematic, but this time it is set around a British woman who falls in love with an Italian man. This novel really is a satire of the British tourism industry of the time. It makes fun of this romanticized ideal of Italy that British tourists would claim to feel and understand, only to then be disappointed by reality. To me, this is Ian Forster's funniest novel too, though I should say that I'm much more familiar with the world he satirizes since my entire family are Italian and I definitely see a lot of my relatives in the characters of this novel. What I love about Where Angels Fear to Tread as well as A Passage to India is that Ian Forster throws his satirical punches both ways. Italian stereotypes are presented and either confirmed or subverted, but so are English stereotypes and the English characters feel just as strange 
and set in their ways as the foreign ones. In 1908, Forster published another short novel, partly set in Italy. This is A Room with a View. Again, this is a commentary on tourism as an English pastime. But unlike Where Angels Fear to Tread, this one's more romantic, more serious and less bitingly satirical. But both of the Italian novels are perfect summer reads. By the way, I would recommend them when the weather gets a bit warmer. And finally, there is just one novel left to talk about, and that is The Longest Journey from 1907. This is actually my least favorite four-star novel, but it is still a four-star read, which just shows you how much I love his books. This story is set around the life of a young man named Ricky, who's just graduating from Cambridge University. He doesn't really know what to do with his life because he really wants to be a writer, but he doesn't have a lot of confidence in his own writing, so he starts teaching at a boarding school for boys instead. This novel stands out because it seems rather action-packed compared to his other novels anyway. There's no like actual action, but, but there is a lot of plot and a lot of character development and a lot of plot twists as well. A lot of things happen to the characters in The Longest Journey, especially a lot of deaths. It's a bit of a strange read, but one that I still really enjoyed, full of those themes and topics that make E.M. Forster novels so wonderful. So this was my assessment of Ian e. Forster's six novels. I can highly recommend that you pick up one of these if they sound interesting to you. I really feel like he's still a rather underrated author of the 20th century. Especially if you're fans of Jane Austen's writing, give these a go. I often feel like Forster's novels are kind of like Jane Austen, but set a century later. If you're interested in slow-paced, beautifully written stories with some romance, some social criticism and a great deal of British satire, then I'm sure you'll love these books as much as I do. Let me know in the comments if you agree with my assessment, which is for novices to start with either Howard's End or Morris, and tell me which Forster novel is your favourite. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!